Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra, and I really have to start with one word, Olympics. You know, as much as I've been looking forward to it after all these years, I did not anticipate the emotions that I was going to feel in watching the first pitch and the first day where every team got to play. It just finally made it feel real after all this time. And there's so much to unpack, so we we will break it down here. And some reminders for ways to keep up with the show. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. Subscribe to Believe in Softball on YouTube and actually watch these episodes as well. So lots to cover, so let's just go ahead and go through today's order. First, we'll cover our bases, some news and updates, softball-wise. Then we'll head into today's interview with none other than Natasha Watley. And she just, she knows what it's like to be on the Olympic stage. She knows what it's like to play and coach in Japan specifically. It's just the ultimate perspective for us right now with the Tokyo Olympics. So I'm super excited for that. And then we'll end things with the Fouts of the Week, our new segment this season, where we share tips to help us get better. All right, let's go. Covering our bases. But I'm betting on the Olympics this year. I mean, it's tough. There's lots going around right now with the COVID-19 variants, the Delta variant. Some athletes have tested positive, et cetera. But we luckily have been able to at least have this initial moment of softball being back in the Olympics. And I just need to provide this context because I want us all to understand the significance of this moment. You know, I got emotional, for example, in between games on day one about the 1996 games. You know, seeing Michelle Smith, Lisa Fernandez, Dot Richardson, Laura Berg relive those games. It was the first time that softball had been in the Olympics. That was 25 years ago. Seeing them relive those moments and knowing that they laid the foundation for us was huge, especially knowing that we have to keep going. You know, it's not in Paris in 2024. We're hoping for it to be back in LA in 2028. Brisbane is 2032. Like we want this to be a part of the Olympic Games forever. And I just, you know, I just had a moment when I saw that sort of throwback to when we first made it to this stage. But looking at the teams, like let's understand this international landscape. So for Japan, the host team, Yukiko Ueno threw the last pitch in Beijing, which was the last time that softball was in the Olympics back in 2008. And she actually threw the first pitch as softball came back to the Olympics in Tokyo 13 years later. That is so freaking cool. And I think to understand too, the enormity of the upset that it was back in 2008, that Japan actually won gold and beat Team USA and did all those things. Ueno was a legend. Like, we all need to know this. I remember talking to Alyssa Haber in the very, very first episode of the show. She spent a lot of time living in Japan. She's played in that league. She's been on Team USA. We talked about Ueno. Like, you can't think about Japanese softball without thinking about her. I mean, at the time, she had thrown 28 innings and over 400 pitches in the last two days when they won gold. And for context, like, USA had won gold in the last three Olympics every single time there was a chance to win gold at the Olympics. The U.S. had done it at this point. They outscored their opponents over 100 runs to just a handful in the last two Olympics before Beijing. So just understanding that moment and how global softball is, is important. And now Japan, here they are. It's the host city, the host country, and they're the reigning gold medalists. So keeping that in mind as we're watching the Tokyo Olympics throughout this time. And then with Team USA, it it really is sort of that long road to redemption. So much time has passed. But looking back to in that last game, Kat Osterman was actually the losing pitcher. And then fast forward to now, she got the start in Team USA's first Olympic game, this time around in Tokyo against Italy. There's just so much poetry here. Like, we have to appreciate it. Monica Abbott was also there in Beijing, and she came in relief in the sixth in the first game here in Tokyo. And you know what? For her, unlike Kat, she didn't retire and come back. She kept playing all this time. And she's played professionally in Japan for a decade. She never stopped. She kept chipping away. And the familiarity with Japanese softball and the culture and that location 
It's so interesting. And you know, who else actually has that familiarity and even speaks Japanese is Michelle Smith. She was calling that game, that last gold medal game in Beijing, and now she's calling the games here in Tokyo. Like so many full circle things throw Jessica Mendoza in that mix as well. She was on that team back in Beijing, and now she's covering the games on the media side, right? And then even the coaches, Taraya Flowers, Laura Berg, they were on that 2008 team, and now they're there coaching with Team USA. So there are so many areas of crossover, full circle moments, all of these things that Team USA is not playing just for their teammates. That's a huge part of it. But the larger USA softball family is really behind them and a part of their mission here in Tokyo. And, you know, we've had the pleasure of interviewing Kat, Monica, Rachel Garcia, Kelsey Stewart, and Coach Heather Tarr on this show. And not only that, but the reserve players, Kehlani Ricketts, Hannah Flippin, obviously Natasha in terms of past players, Lauren Lappin, and Coach Candrea. So I highly recommend also going back and listening to those episodes to get the full perspective as to what this Olympics means for Team USA. And then you look at Team Australia. You know, they medaled in every single Olympics that has existed. They have three bronze medals and a silver medal. And Stacey Porter is also a returner from the Beijing team at that time. She has a couple of those medals. And I think it's important to note that Australia is always competitive. But at this point, it's safe to say they're looking to push through that barrier and break into getting that gold medal, getting there for the first time. And Gabby Plain, another Believe in Softball guest in front of the show, obviously known very well as a UW pitcher, but she is just one of a few current NCAA players. You look at Arizona's Julia Kutsianopoulos and New Mexico's Andrea Howard as well, who are playing for Italy. So that's a really cool story in itself, just to see these young players playing with these veterans. Such a cool dynamic. More veterans as well on Team Canada. More people who were there back in 2008. Daniel Laurie, Jen Salling, Kaylee Rafter, and Lauren Bay Regula. And they just missed the podium back in 2008. I remember when Danielle came on the show. This was last year. She was probably like the sixth or seventh guest I've ever had. And I asked her, you know, hey, like, I'd love to have you back on. When do you think you'd come back? And she said, after we win a medal, right? Like, it's just so ingrained. And that has been such a chip on her shoulder in a positive way for all of this time. So having interviewed her and then Victoria Hayward, who's also been a longtime captain of Team Canada, she was on the show as well and has amazing perspective. She had a great start to the Olympics as well. Really recommend listening to those episodes too. So when we take a look here too, Japan, USA, Australia, and Canada are the Tokyo teams who were also there in 2008. But Italy and Mexico were not. Italy has been to the games before. Remember we said Erica Pioncastelli, another guest of ours on Believe in Softball. Her mom was actually in the Olympics back in 2000, right? And now here she is also representing Italy. Such a cool family story. But they have never actually won a game at the Olympics when they have been on this stage. So there's, there's sort of that chip on their shoulder. And then actually, sadly, their head coach passed away from COVID complications earlier this year. And so their assistant, Federico Pizzolini, has stepped in since then. But it's just a little extra motivation and something they're carrying with them, even at the European Championships before coming to Tokyo. It's something that I think is weighing on them and that they're using to, to fuel their journey because he was such a big part of it. And then you look at Team Mexico, it's their first time ever at the Olympics. That is a huge deal. And one of my favorite things about them, we've had four of the existing team members on this show before. We had Daniel O'Toole in, from the circle on the rubber, Sachelle Palacios behind the dish, Tori Vidal is at first base, and Brittany Cervantes, who's actually one of my childhood teammates. Um, and it's so cool to see all of them where they are now. But they've all told me some version of just the fact that they call themselves Las Brujas, which means the witches. And it kind of started just from their coach calling them witches one day at practice because they were messing around and it just stuck. And it's really this family that they've created within their team. And I have to say it's so unique, like to see this group come together. Some have been on the team for a really long time, like Sachelle Palacios. Some came on more recently, like Brittany Cervantes. But 
they're all such a tight knit group that really is proud to represent Mexico. I just have a lot of respect for it. So I think if we look at all the teams there in Tokyo, all of them have something personal to play for. Everyone there has the same goal of obviously like everyone wants gold, but even the bigger picture for the game, everyone wants to grow the game globally. Everyone wants to enjoy and soak in being on that Olympic stage. Everyone wants softball to be back in the Olympics as much as possible from here on out, right? Everyone has those goals, but I think there are unique extra elements here, like an extra layer of motivation that they all have to tap into. So seeing all of this kind of come to fruition on the field in Tokyo now is really special. And I just want us to appreciate this. I have to say too, the style that I'm seeing, I was expecting this too, for it to be a little bit interesting, just because it's different than college, right? Like, yes, we just saw all these teams who have Nike sponsorships and all kinds of things. And some of the uniforms are pretty put together. And some of it's quirky, you know, or just a little bit different on the international stage. Like I have noticed at least four of the teams, you know, Mexico and Canada had the late game in day one, but Japan, Australia, USA, Italy, they have these sunglasses that I call the shields because they don't have like their own two separate lenses. It's like all connected, almost like a unibrow lens where it's just like one big shield. And I just... I love it. And they have it like where it's kind of complimentary to their team colors or country colors, you know, and I'm just like, I'm here for it. I love it. I, I think it's hilarious and also functional, right? So good for them. But also Japan, I noticed is the only country, at least on day one, still wearing the OG shorts. I respect it. You know, everyone else is in pants now. We've kind of moved past that phase. But you know what? If I won gold that way, I'd probably do it again too. So respect. But I have to say overall too, the custom gear is pretty sick. Like I saw an all red catcher's glove, catcher's mitt for Mexico's Palacios, right? All white catcher's gear for USA's Aubrey Monroe. And I I just love when a team's colors are incorporated boldly and creatively. And even more so, I think on this stage when there's like pride for your country involved. Like of course, like pride runs deep for your school on that college softball stage. But I think Pride for your country that you're representing is just next level. So any unique way they can do that, I'm here for it. So with all that being said, the actual gameplay that we're seeing on the field, right? Like I think there's definitely nerves going on. Like there's such a buildup. There's a lot of factors that have played into this leading up to this moment. But I got to say, straight up, Kat, Monica, Lori, and Ueno still got it on the rubber. Period. I am so excited that they're back and get another opportunity. I will say, I think pitchers overall, something that we're seeing is these pitchers have strong off speeds. Like that is a key component in their repertoire, like in their toolbox as pitchers. They utilize that pitch and you have to. We talk about this all the time. I say this on broadcast constantly. Good pitchers change planes, but they also change speeds. That's how you keep hitters off balance. And we are seeing that at this level. And I think we're also seeing on the offensive side, a little bit more manufacturing, like over the long ball that we're so used to. And it's just like left and right, we're seeing balls leave the yard in college softball. More than that, and like all these extra base hits, we're actually seeing like base hits, moving people over. You know, don't get me wrong. Lineups, I think, are going to get in a little bit more of a groove. And we're going to see some more of that. And Japan already showed a lot of power. They had three home runs in their first game, right? Like that is definitely there. But I think there's a little bit more of base-to-base mentality here in terms of bringing runs across. Speed is also a weapon in that sense. We're seeing people steal. We're also seeing some sacrifices or some slaps, some small ball to get people to move around the bases. That's going to be huge. It also puts pressure on the defense, and defense is going to be key. We, you know, There's a little bit of trying to get used to the new field, the turf, all the different elements that are there. But you know, we say it, it's that dad quote, like defense wins championships, but it's true. Like defense is going to be important when you have that speed and when you have teams trying to manufacture and move runners around the bases. And this feels a little bit old school, you know, but I don't necessarily think we should think of it that way. I think what this is, is like, this is what happens at this kind of elite level. Like this is international. This is, these are the best players in the world. So yes, the approach 
is less like, well, let's just hit a bunch of home runs, like OU style, like we saw this past season. And it's more about chipping away and capitalizing on mistakes. That's going to be key too, because mistakes are going to hurt. Sometimes it's like, who's going to make the first mistake? And that really changes the trajectory of a game. So that's going to be huge. And that's just a part of this level of softball. And with that being said, there are a lot of elements to keep in mind too. So they are playing at Fukushima Azuma Baseball Stadium in Japan. This facility, I think a lot of people have noticed this. I've seen Twitter chatter about this. The facility is actually a baseball field. Yes, should softball have its own facility? Of course. But the reasoning behind this is because the WBSC submitted baseball and softball into Tokyo as a single bid together. So that kind of yields itself to only providing one facility, building one place for both baseball and softball to compete. It feels really counterintuitive because Japan has amazing softball stadiums, amazing baseball stadiums. Like, why can't we just use one of those? But this is part of the the reason and the way that we were able to get the sport back in. So to me, it's like, yes, I think we should probably moving forward fight for maybe softball specific, better facilities, et cetera. But I think the main thing is that we're back and now we need to do all we can to keep that going. So yes, you'll see that it's converted. There's a temporary backstop, temporary fences. The dugouts are kind of moved forward outside of the baseball dugouts. It's a little bit different. It's, it's something that you have to get used to when watching it. The turf itself, it's all turf. This reminds me of Athletes Unlimited when they played at the Chicago Bandits field. It's, it's slick. There's no infield dirt. There's only a little bit of dirt like at the pitching rubber itself. But other than that, it's just really slick turf all around. Something to keep in mind for defense. And then you think about the weather. Now, I think a lot of people are talking about the heat, for example. And the forecast really is high 80s, low 90s throughout these Olympics. Okay. To be honest with you, all these players have played in that and on probably much hotter (laughs) of a climate than that. However, I think another factor that we have to keep in mind is the humidity. Like even on day one, it was like over 40% humidity. Like that, I think, is what's a little bit trickier because, you know, you can get a little moisture on your hands as a pitcher, as an infielder as well, trying to make throws, outfielders, really anyone. It's a little stickier. It's just something to keep in mind. The ball travels a little bit differently in the air when there's more humidity. So that's something to work through for these teams. At the same time, like if you ever played softball in the South, which many of the American born Olympians have who played in the States for college, you have experienced that before, right? Like if you played an SEC team at home, you know what that is. So it, it is something though, to keep in mind that, you know, they haven't had the same amount of game reps that they normally would leading up to the Olympics though. So even though they've done some of these things in the past, they might not be as a as in game shape as they're used to being in these kind of situations. Then there's the time. Obviously it's a time zone thing change. That's part of the benefit that you have as a host country. But some of these day games, like these are really all day games. Like some of these are 9 a.m. games, local time. And if you think about that, that's an early wake up call. Like back in college, whenever our game time was, we basically had to be at breakfast like four hours before that and then go get ready and then, warm up for two hours before the game, blah, blah, blah. So that could be like a 5 a.m. wake up call for that first game of the day, whenever you're, you as a team have that slot. So that's something to keep in mind. The only real night game, it looks like is the gold medal game. So maybe that's like this like extra, like playing under the lights moment that we're going to see with whoever's going to claim that spot of being the best in the world. So it's interesting, but these are day games. So the heat, humidity are a factor and just the lighting right? That'll be an adjustment for whoever plays in that gold medal game. And of course, there are actually quite a bit of rules that are a little bit different than college. And there's a whole conversation really about how maybe we should have more consistency with rules at every level would be beneficial. But just to highlight a few, because there's a ton, you'll notice the safety bags at first base, that orange bag. Run rules are different. It's 15 runs after three, 10 after four, seven after five. So we actually saw that with Japan run rolling Australia to, to kick things off. The pitchers have several rules that are a little bit different, but a couple of big ones is they are actually allowed to leap. You know, that 
if you're a righty, your right foot, if you're a lefty, your left foot is supposed to in college when you're dragging, that is supposed to stay on the ground from the mound throughout your wind up and your, your release. In international play and at the Olympics, they are actually allowed to leap off the mound. So it used to be called crow hopping, but they don't have to keep that foot down the whole time. And so sometimes you can, you can push further off the mound, which may actually give you more velocity as well. So you're allowed to do that in international play. You also must do things like present the ball for two seconds to the batter before actually starting your windup. So we've seen a couple things called, you know, in day one, Dallas Escobedo got called for an illegal pitch. Monica Abbott did too. Having, you know, to make some of these adjustments because they're getting back into this groove. And in terms of COVID-19 challenges, obviously, like I said, they didn't have as much prep in terms of actual game reps they normally would, but also just the environment itself, like not having fans, like even leading up to this, not knowing what was going to happen with the Olympics, like the Olympic Village, I'd imagine, is very different than it maybe normally would be. And then some emotional aspects as well. You know, something that was not known before is that Team USA actually, for example, had to send their reserve players home. They were not allowed to stay in the stands and cheer on their team as they originally thought. So for context, every team gets 15 players named to the roster, but then teams also have some reserve players and alternates. For Team USA, that was Kaylani Ricketts, Hannah Flippin, and Taylor Edwards. And they had been training no differently than anyone else on Team USA. They had been just as huge a part of the prep to get to this point for that program. And they thought they were going to get to be there for those moments for their teammates. And they don't get to be. And it's just disappointing. I mean, there's so much that goes with COVID-19, but I can't, it's heartbreaking for them. And I think from that perspective too, like throw that into the bucket of like that sort of personal extra layer of motivation that some of these teams have. Team USA and anyone else who had to do the same thing as they're competing. And I think I have to give kudos to them for being just absolute selfless teammates and being wonderful role models for young softballers as they witness what it is to be on Team USA, represent your country, and pursue the Olympics. The last thing I'll say about the Olympics, at least for now, guys, because this is, there's so much to unpack. It's crazy. It's all within a week because there's so much here, but the broadcast. So you'll notice that the presentation's a little different than what we're used to at the Women's College World Series on ESPN. Score bugs are slightly different. The graphics are a little different. For me personally, when I got a little thrown off is when they listed each player's height in like the metric system. So it was like meters, like one point something something meters for their height. I'm like, wait, what is this? You know, and it's like, yes, of course, most of the world is on the metric system, but the Americans watching this, we're not, right? So I would say there might be some things like that, and I'm seeing some chatter of of feedback for some of that on Twitter. I think at this point, yes, we could have a little bit more energy. There could be improvements, blah, blah, blah. But I think the biggest thing that we can do to support is to keep watching the games. Tune into as many as possible. Let's get those ratings. Let's show the IOC, the world, that softball is in demand and that we love it and it deserves to be on this stage. So with all that being said, someone who has been one of the faces of Olympic softball in her career is today's guest. I want you to hear from her because she's got all the inside info. So let's go ahead and head into the interview. She's a two-time Team USA Olympian. UCLA Hall of Famer, NCAA National Champion, retired pro softball player, nonprofit founder, and slapping guru, Natasha Watley. Tasha, it's so good to talk to you again. Yeah, Jenna, I got to get you to be my hype man. That was quite the intro. I love that. (laughs) I know. I was like thinking about it. I'm like, how did I introduce her last time? Like the very first time that we did this together, which was crazy. It's like a year and a half ago almost. Crazy, but I was like, you know, what? let's spice it up a little this time. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Thank you, thank you for the cool intro. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we'll work that out. Venmo, like we got it. <laughs> but seriously, I call people who like have been guests on the show like friends of the show, right? But this is you're the only repeat guest that I've had 
And now technically this is the third time that you've been on the show. Like obviously we did our one-on-one like way back in last Mm -hmm. February. And then we did the panel with an awesome group last year. And then here you are again. So like, I would say now we've moved to best friend of the show territory. We're like, we're like besties. So I, I appreciate it. Like this is, it's been so fun just to see the show blossom. And so I just, I feel very honored and very lucky that you're having me back. Well, you're a day one, so always. <laughs> Love it. But I thought it was so awesome, too. Like, recently you were obviously at the uh, celebrity softball game for the MLB and all that. I just love seeing softball representation. So how was it? Like, tell me everything. Yeah, Jenna, it was awesome. Like, uh, got back Wednesday two days ago and exhausted, like whooped. Um my role as an MLB ambassador is to be at all their youth programming. And so throughout the weekend, I mean, literally our schedule is jam packed from the moment that we get there. Um, but it was so much fun. I mean, more, I mean, obviously just coming off the year that we had off of COVID 2020, I think people were just excited to be back out in person, um, for kids, my gosh, like their energy, like they can, they wanted to hug you and touch you and feel, you know what I mean? Just like all the things like, things that all these kids have been deprived of the the last year. So you could feel that energy. Um, It was just, it's awesome. I mean, the fact that MLB is recognizing softball, I mean, this wasn't the case 20 years ago, you know, and um, I grew up a big baseball fan and softball was like nowhere on MLB's radar, you know, when I was growing up. So for them to even recognize that, um, to recognize us and just to see us, it's just been kind of a really cool movement to be a part of and to be a part of their youth programming, to be a part and be represented in celebrity game. Like, I mean, it's like, man, we made it, we made it. And um, I think for us, I just, I think the future is just so bright for our game. Our, our game has grown so much anyways without MLB, but I mean, just with, to be, to have that marriage, to have that partnership with them, partner with USA Softball, really elevating the national team and really supporting that movement. Um, it just feels really, really good. I think it's amazing. Like the more bridges there are, the better, right? And I, th- I really do think too, like all of us, our goal at the end of the day is to grow women's sports. And this is our favorite sport, obviously. But to do that, it's like we need like our male allies, like our counterparts, like working together is mm-hmm. always going to be a good thing. So I just and to have the trio that you guys were meaning like you, Jenny and Lauren Chamberlain, like what a trio. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know, so fun. Like it's just it's so fun. And it doesn't even I mean, it's supposed to technically be work. It, I mean, it's not work. I mean, it's just like it's pure passion. It's fun. Um, I just I feel so lucky to be a part and um we had a blast we had so much fun well it's been cool too to see like you said with the national team like the stand Mm -hmm. beside her tour that the mlb was Mm -hmm. promoting and all that stuff Mm -hmm. and i know that you've been involved with some of those things like in terms of prepping for the olympics which i mean how excited are all of us right and i feel like you especially which is why i'm like so thrilled to talk to you in general but especially right now (laughs) like as the Olympics are like upon us right. finally again. Um, so how have you been involved with that sort of lead up to the Olympics? Yeah, well, the lead up was supposed to be more dramatic and like the, the role that I was supposed to play was supposed to be a bigger role, obviously, you know, given the last year's just been crazy. So um, at the beginning of 2020, you know, as an ambassador and that partnership with MLB and USA Softball, we went on their like, first announcement of their stand by me tour stand by her tour um that was in january so we went to new york we went to dc um got to you know do a whole bunch of promotional stuff with them and for me the role was just to share experiences just to there's a lot of young athletes are uh, first time olympians you know only cat and monica are the only returning Um, So honestly, just like sharing experiences, um, just sharing, encouraging, supporting, um, being a sister to them. um, That's really what my role is. And like, that's the easiest role I've ever had in my entire life. And honestly, more than anything, I'm, I'm just excited for them. But MLB's role was just to 
elevate them, give them a platform. Um, what was supposed to happen was along their tour, um, they're supposed to go into the MLB markets and, you know, get that, um, that get that stage and that platform. It just didn't happen. Um, and, you know, with the, they're getting ready in 2021. Just it was a condensed tour. Um, it didn't really roll out ha- as planned. And so that part is the frustrating part. It's like we finally got MLB on board and they're ready to give us this big, huge stage. And, you know, in each of the markets, they're going to, you know, have these this, um, you know, this moment where they can, you know, address the crowd and somebody from the team throwing out the first pitch. Um, it's frustrating, but, you know, it, it is what it is. And I, I think that the um, the partnership that MLB um, they're looking big picture. They're not even just looking just now. And that was just like an introductory um, activation that they had planned. And, but I think that they're looking at big picture. Like they, they see, they see us, they see us. And I, I think that we are closer than we think to a pro league, a true, true bona fide pro league. Right. I think we're closer than we think. When it's so important, like th- that's the thing is, the Olympics is such a big deal that it's back because it's another huge stage for softball. But having a very established, like centralized pro league is also huge. Obviously, that's what helps a lot of the men's sports. But even seeing like the WNBA and how they've partnered with the NBA, like seeing that kind of mm-hmm. growth, all of those things are, are obviously things that we want. <laughs> so, you know, of course, like with COVID and everything, like you said, we can't do everything we'd like to do like that. It just is what it is. Even the, the games themselves are going to be not exactly the same without, you know, all the fans packed in there and all that good stuff. But I still appreciate seeing you and Jenny and everybody and the MLB doing what you can in this situation. Yeah. yeah. No, it's been, it's been fun. Like it's been a lot of fun to be a part and I just like really, really hopeful, really, really excited. Um, You could just feel it. I just, I feel like we're on the brink of something. I mean, even just coming off of this world series that we just had women's college world series, you know, last month, which seems like so long ago now, but just, I mean, how many storylines came out of there? Um, I mean, just the World Series itself was just entertaining. Obviously, the ratings proved that, you know. So, I don't know. I, I just, I feel like it's just an exciting time for our, our game. And I just think that the best is yet to really to come, in my opinion. I agree. When you look at college softball and then international softball, what are kind of the differences or the different nuances that we'll see, you know, in Tokyo versus what we saw all spring with NCAA? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing is just the support. I mean, I think the college game is well supported um, throughout the country. Um, Colleges have stepped up. Facilities are better. Just the, the investment into the game at the college level, it's there. Um, You will not see that internationally. It's not the same across the board. Um, it's hit or miss with some countries, you know, you'll have a Japan that does have it and then you'll have, uh, Italy that doesn't have it, you know? And so, um, I think that's the part that's missing is that worldwide international flair. Um, that's the piece that's missing. And so, um, you know, that doesn't mean that the competition won't be, um, as great. I think we're going to be in for a thrill of, it's going to be, the Olympics is going to be crazy. Like the, there's all those teams, they are well matched <laughs> and so it's going to be it's going to be a dog fight um but i think in terms of when you're thinking big picture you know if something rolls out of this um i think you know it's hit or miss with some countries in terms of support that's a good point i remember when danielle o'toole came on the show she we talked about how she was the one actually like posting on team mexico social media and like just wearing mm-hmm. multiple hats right because yep. to your point like not everybody has the same support i mean obviously the ideal state for us is that everyone has maximum support at, at right. some point, And we hope that that point soon, but it's true. I mean, I think we see that a little bit in college softball in terms of like, you know, the power five versus maybe some mid majors and other schools, but that's changing a lot. So hopefully we can see that change on the international stage too. Absolutely. Absolutely. But when you're sharing your experiences, like you said, with, the teams, the players, et cetera, like what are the main things that you typically share that you think are helpful? I mean, the biggest and the most obvious is like 
enjoy the journey because it literally is like a blink of an eye. So I think that, um, and then I think it's more so just embracing your role as an ambassador, like just really stepping into that because it comes not so natural to some people, you know, like that's not something that I signed up for. I just wanted to like play the best softball at the highest level, you know, like, but you've got to embrace this role. Like you are a role model. You are now representative. You are representing your country. Like there's so many things that are embodied in that. And so just really stressing that I think is the biggest thing is like, okay, like step into that because um, you, you know, you all get to be uniquely you and you get to um, be celebrated in different ways, but you get to bring light to anybody can become, not anybody, but anybody can become an Olympian if you dream it and you put the work into it. And I think just really being that um, representative um, of our country and of our sport. Right. I, I would imagine that trying to balance this idea of like, soaking everything up, enjoying the moments, you know, like making the most of it versus also trying to remain like laser focused tunnel vision to achieve your goal is kind of tough. Like how did you do that when you were doing this? The balance is hard because like I said, I just wanted to, I signed up for just competing at that highest level. Um, And then there's all these other things that come with it. And so like that balance is rough. And I think, I mean, you know, 20, I mean, so 2008, I, I will say it, I, I don't know. I feel like it caught up to us a little bit because we were balancing a lot and like a lot of, um, we had a, such a great platform built from 2004 to, to, to 2008. Like we were rock stars, we were softball celebrities, you know? And so it's hard. It's really, really hard to stay focused and just focus on the game. And, you know, you've got endorsements, you've got, you know, appearances, you've got all of these opportunities that come your way. And so it's really, it's a really hard line to, to, to find of staying focused in like, what's the goal, you know, our goal is to win a gold medal. And I think that the, the team that we have, I think that they have that in mind. I think they're ready for it. Um, because, Unfortunately, fortunately, like they, we lost a lot of steam from 2008 to 2000 to, to now, you know, and so I think like they're in it blindly and it's not going to be as much of a distraction. They're aware, um, but I think that they've done such a beautiful job of uh, embracing their roles and just really being focused. And so I, I, I just I think it is it's, 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 it's rough. It's rough once that that fame comes and that um, notoriety comes and like you're recognizable as a national team or a USA member, it's, it's not easy. And so, um, that's the, that's the, that's the tough line, but I think it's kind of, kind of going back to your roots and going back to, you know, why you started, um, and that journey up into getting to that point of like why you're there. And so it's, it's just takes that quick moment of, of thinking back to that, but, um, definitely it's, 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 it's hard. It's not easy. It, it's definitely hard. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a reason you guys were asked to be in the celebrity softball game, right? Like you are softball celebrities. I think I told you this last time, like the first time we ever talked on the show that, you know, I still remember and I had like the real dream team, the cover of Sports Illustrated with all of you guys on there. And it was Team USA. And it's like, that's what everyone when I was growing up wanted to to do and be was an Olympian on Team USA, right? But like, yes, it's, it's, it's so hard, I would imagine, to kind of be able to play both roles and do it effectively. Absolutely. And that just leads me, I mean, I mean, this isn't even your question, and I'm like just totally steering it, but that leads me to like the whole new NIL, you know, like yep. for collegiate athletes. It's just a really tough line, like, because I feel like collegiately, that's your time to really learn a lot about yourself, um, really to like just be vulnerable to be to able to thrive but now you throw in money and you throw in you know the notoriety and like contracts it just takes away from the purity of the game a little bit so that's what makes me worried about it so I I I think it is a tough line it's really hard to to play at your highest ability and also stay focused when you have this whole other ball game of endorsements money negotiation contracts business like it's just it's a lot um, it really is. And so I think 
going back to your original question, I, I think that's the hard, that is one of the hardest things in, in sharing those stories of like how to navigate through all of those things. A hundred percent. Actually, as we were talking, I was thinking of name image likeness too, for this exact reason, because it's true. I mean, we talked about already a little bit, the differences between like college versus international. It's like, that's one of the differences is that it was mm-hmm. like kind of purely amateur. There weren't all these like endorsements outside of whatever your athletic department had, you know, like we had Nike mm-hmm. at Stanford or whatever, but beyond that, you didn't right. have this. And I, you know, my family always referred to like the student athlete experience as double duty, right? Cause like you're a student and you're an athlete, mm-hmm. but now it's like, triple duty because now you also have like your oh brand God. and all that stuff. So, you know, it's just like yeah. mind blown. I don't know how yeah. I survived and I, you know, I'm curious to see how these student athletes do it. I know it's, but it's a whole new world. I mean, I think we're ready for it. I think it's, you know, I love the fact that the athletes have the opportunity, but I just, I pray and I hope that it doesn't take away from the purity of being a collegiate athlete for sure. Right. I agree. I think there's so much goodness with college softball. So I, I have faith, you know, I'm optimistic, but it's something we definitely need to keep our, our eye on. Yep. 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 It could turn into an ugly monster. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> For sure. But I feel like we, we've talked about too, like different styles of different international teams. Like you obviously have a mm-hmm. ton of experience in Japan specifically, like mm-hmm. playing team Japan, of course, but then also, you know, all the years you spent in Japan playing, coaching, all of those mm-hmm. things. And I remember you telling me, and it's kind of stuck with me since before, that the approach to the game that the Japanese have is like very precise and me- like methodical. And I-, I don't know, I'm I'm excited to see kind of how the different regions bring their spin to our game. Is that something that, I don't know, that you think about? Yeah, well, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, just from being in Japan, Japan has studied every single team from top to bottom, they know their eating regimens. They know that they like, they know everything because they just study you for so long. And so like that, that's the part that makes it exciting to watch them because you'll know that they'll be prepared. Um, They, they do not enter any arena unprepared. They're almost uncomfortable if they don't know anything. Whereas I feel like uh, here in the states, we, we thrive off of. It doesn't matter who's in that other d- dugout. Right. You know, we're gonna show up. You know, and it's that uh, we don't know all the information, but we're gonna figure it out. Everything is figure outable. You know, and so I think it is gonna be fun to watch all the different styles. And I think you think about a team Mexico, which most of them are American born, and it's like this um, camaraderie or this like team that has come together and really blended. And like it's they're very talented. Like it's um, I think that they have that going for them. Like this, like splash of, you know, blending all of these athletes together. Um, It's just, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's going to be fun to see um, who rises to the top. And I think even just when we think about Canada, I mean, I think team Canada, like they just have a chip on their shoulder. They're like always right there nipping at the bud. You know, when I was playing and a lot of those athletes have continued to play, um, and I think that they have a chip on their shoulder. It's like, we're really good too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like who, why not us, you know? And so I think that, um, all of those different storylines and, and backgrounds is going to make the Olympics really interesting. I think. Absolutely. I think about team Canada and team Mexico specifically a lot too, because Mexico is so scrappy, you know, I just, I just right. love their, their attitude. But then with Team Canada, I think of Danielle Laurie immediately because, and you know, Danielle, it's like she already plays with a chip on her shoulder in general, let alone like the comeback. She's a mom, like the delay for a year. Like, I feel like it's like, we're going to like unleash a beast here (laughs) in Tokyo. I I agree. I agree. And I, I, it's just going to, it's going to be fun to watch it all unfold. Um, By no means, I I think nobody has a cakewalk and that's what makes it really exciting. So It'll be fun. It'll be fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And okay, yes, you mentioned that Japan specifically, like, will even know, like, their exact eating regimen. Okay, <laughs> this made me think of something. So I had seen this, like, old interview with Kobe and how he talked about he only had McDonald's, like, you know, at the Olympics or when he'd be playing internationally because 
it's the only thing he was familiar with and, you know, maybe you're kind of risk averse, whatever it is. Do, did you like try new foods, like local foods that you maybe weren't familiar with, like at the Olympics, or do you just stick with what you know? Like, how do you do that at such a big event? Um, I know. Well, the, they do a really good job in the Olympic Village of like having cuisines from around the world. And so like, I am an explorer. I will try everything once. You only get one shot with me. And if that's, you know, then I stick to, I'm kind of a routine girl. Um, I'll just go to the same thing. So I'm not, I wasn't an exploring like every meal, maybe like those first meals, I'll try something new or whatnot. But I mean, that's the beauty of the Olympic Village and like, they're very mindful of healthy, nutritious food, but they're also mindful of having a cuisine that's, you know, international friendly um, to each region. So I think, uh, yeah, like I wasn't really eating McDonald's, but I, I, I ate, you know, a salad, pasta, you know, things that they would provide, um, you know, like your simple things, they would have pizza. And so I think that's the fun part too, is seeing how creative they are with the meals that they're providing too, because they do have to be mindful of each region and, and trying to create, um, prepare food that everybody's familiar. Totally. Cause I just think about like, it's like, I've seen people and I don't know how this works. Like I'm not super familiar with sushi, but I've seen people like eating fish. It like looks like it's live, like it's moving and they'll eat it. You know what I mean? It's like, would you do something like that the day before you're playing like a metal game? Yeah. I probably wouldn't do that <laughs> the day before a big game, but I probably would do a double dare like after we won our gold medal. Like, let's go. Like, <laughs> sure. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No, probably not a smart move to do it the day before the game, but yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Like, we'll do this. At, at the end. That's the reward. Like, it'll be part of the come down from the high that is yep. the Olympics. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So funny. <laughs> well, what else is in the Olympic Village? Like, what is it like outside of just the food? I'm, I'm curious because it's such a cool place where you get to interact with other athletes, at least normally. I mean, I'm not sure what the COVID, you know, protocols would be this time around, but from your experience. Yeah. yeah I mean, when we were there 2008, I mean, there's like, laundry you can turn your laundry in there's like a you know public laundry and like you have everything's credentialed so everything um is organized by your credentials so you could turn it in and get it you could turn it in daily um they have coffee shops they have um you know places where uh they'll have like little shops like merchandise shops you know with olympic apparel that you can go shopping um, I feel like in 2008, if I not remember, like, I feel like I'm so old, I can't remember, but there was like this little like area that kind of was like a bazaar type, you know, like little shops and yeah. stuff that like places would come up. So I feel like um, they just, they, they improve it every single time. 2004, like uh, 2008 definitely trumped 2004. So it's like every single time it's always better. Right. So um Yeah. Uh, there's just like a lot going on and all I mean the biggest part about the Olympic Village is like seeing a Kobe Bryant or seeing these athletes like roaming through the village I mean we um I think we uh James Blake remember James Blake he played am I saying his name right tennis player and he like was in our building you know so like at the time big huge tennis star like getting to see him leave to go for his match like what like this is crazy like this is and it's just it's, it's like this time where you like really clicks to you like we're on the same level like we're all here we all are the best in our sports like the chosen athlete to represent our country so it's like this kind of like awakening that's like yeah I deserve to be here but it's also really cool too and humbling to like see all these amazing athletes for sure totally especially like away from the field, the pool, the track, like, you know, whatever their area of competition is, it's like, mm -hmm. just nice. What, what do we, what do you do? What do Olympians do when you're not on the field, for example, during the Olympics? Um, well, we usually try to get a workout in, workout in, um, if we don't have like an organized like team practice, definitely like just get like a little cardio in or do something easy. Um, but honestly, like, we were fortunate because we would maybe have like a, you know, Coach Kendra would allow us to like go out for a day and explore or go see something or do something as a team. And so like kind of was like a team bonding, but we also got to sightsee a little bit. Um, 
but we, to be honest, we didn't really have too many days off. Um, you know, once we're, once we're there and for softball, we kind of always ran throughout mm-hmm. the whole entire Olympic, um, throughout the whole entire game. So we were there from start to finish. So that was like, not so much of a luxury that we didn't really have that much downtime. That's the thing is that this time it's all like within what, six days, like less than a week, basically the entire yeah. Olympics will be played. So that's kind of wild. Right. Right. And so the softball, they start before the actual opening ceremony. Yeah. So their opening ceremonies is what, next Friday, they start like Tuesday or Wednesday. So, yeah, which I, I kind of like it. I mean, listeners will know this because I said this in the last episode, but I'm like, it's like the universe knew that we could not wait a second longer <laughs> to right. see Olympic right. softball. You know, it's like, no, right. we're not even waiting for opening ceremonies. We're just going. Right. We're just gonna go for it. No, I'm I'm here for it. I can't I can't wait, Jenna. Like I, it's gonna be so fun. Like I just all the all the Olympic vibes. I mean, it, like there's a, it's indescribable. So um, it'll be fun. I know. I feel like uh, logically, I know that it's like indescribable, but I'm like asking you to describe it all. You know, <laughs> like I'm like tell me everything. <laughs> I'm so old. I'm so old. I can't even remember. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, it's I feel like it's just such. I mean, everyone knows this, but it's just, we're being reminded of it now that softball's back in it. Like, mm-hmm. it's such an elite group throughout the world. Like, Olympians mm-hmm. are just their own category in so many ways, at least right. in my opinion, you know? But I'd imagine, like, cool. yeah. so for you, like, what were your best moments in that experience? And what were maybe some of, like, the less glamorous moments, too? Yeah. Um, I would say, like, the the best moments were opening ceremonies. I mean, without a doubt, 2008, like I have like a highlight reel. Um, and I think like that was our set, me personally, my second time going to the Olympics. So like I have this different, a different perspective, different outlook, like I'm going to enjoy each and every moment. 2004 went by so fast. Um, and really like take the time to interact and engage with the other athletes, mm-hmm. USA athletes, other countries, doesn't matter. Like this is the Olympics. I didn't do that in 2004. So opening ceremonies. I mean, I always share the story of seeing, I mean, seeing meeting Kobe Bryant, like we have pictures with Kobe Bryant in 2008 and he was getting bombarded from like every country, but I don't know. He like kind of gravitated towards our softball team. And like, we just like shielded him at one point and like created the circle around him. Cause like every country was just coming up to him wanting to take a picture. It's Kobe Bryant. And so right. Um, but that's before, that's before I got my picture with them. So <laughs> make sure I got my picture, then let's shield them, you know? Um, so that's a, like a memory that I'll never forget. I think like the not so glamorous is like literally to get to the buses. So in 2008, like we literally had to like hike through the village. So we like, we can't like softball. We got bat bags, we've got nets, we've got balls. And like, we literally have to like, walk a little like probably like at least a mile or so to get to the bus so like that's like the not glamorous like you think you're like an olympian like that a limo should pick you up to go to the games like um just to get to the buses was like a trek and so it's not like we're gymnasts or tennis players where we have just some cute little small bags like lugging our big old bat bags through the village and like you can hear us coming through for a mile away um So that wasn't the glam. That's like the not glamorous part. But like, I mean, it's not that bad, but it's like not something that you can you think about. Totally. I like this reminds me of freshman year in college where, you know, like the freshmen get all the worst jobs, right? Carrying the heaviest net and like all the worst things to carry. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I've made it to the top of my game in the entire world. And here we are again. Oh, yeah. Like being an Olympian doesn't make you exempt from carrying the equipment. for sure. So. There you go. <laughs> well, that's humbling, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I think that's so funny about Kobe, too. I remember you mentioned that, too. We talked about it the first time we ever talked, and I think that's so awesome. But it's just funny to me. It's like all these people wanting to talk to him, and I'm, now I'm just thinking about, like, little do they know he was just eating McDonald's the whole time, you know? Right? <laughs> I mean, that was like, that's like the top secret. I mean, shoot, if Kobe's eating McDonald's, like, we can all eat McDonald's. Let's go. You know? Right? It's an honor to chat with Natasha. I mean, not just once, but three times on the show, right? And this time it hit different. I can't overemphasize how major it is that softball is back in the Olympics. I know I keep saying it because it's true. I want us all to enjoy this and understand where we want to go from here. 
Because to know that, we also have to know where we've been. And I think Natasha is such a great person to give us that kind of perspective on both sides of the coin. So with that, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about resiliency. And this is a word that I think of when I think of women's sports and especially softball for obvious reasons, right? The 13-year wait for the Olympics, COVID-19 hitting right at the beginning of the college season in 2020, maybe even a little bit less overall mainstream coverage than our women female athlete counterparts in soccer or basketball at the pro and international level, like even those little nuances. But I think the softball product just gets better and better. And we're still fighting for that respect and recognition that it deserves. So how do you get through that? I've talked on this show with a dozen players who are competing at the Tokyo Olympics right now, including Heather Tarr, who's coaching there, and some past Olympic legends, you know, Natasha Lappin, Kandrea. And I've just realized from all of these conversations, something that they all have in common. They've all, A, identified their priorities, and B, relentlessly focused on them. I think some of the priorities, too, that are pretty universal with these groups of women is gratitude, focusing on teammates, playing for each other, getting better, and then growing the game. Those are just a few. I think, though, that it's important to note that doing prioritization like this, prioritizing what matters, that's a form of self-care. So if you do that, you can keep going. And while it's never going to be easy, there's going to be lots of hard things. When you're doing it for the right reasons, it makes it easier, at least. Take Daniel Laurie, for example. I mean, she has been very open about how hard it is coming out of retirement and getting back into performance shape in her 30s, being away from her children Right. And I remember her sharing about how one of her daughters asked her, like, hey, mom, when you're away playing softball, do you remember that you have kids? And something like that, like that can be crushing if you allow it to be. You know, but I think she's also been open about her goal of showing her daughters and other girls and women that it can be done, that pursuing her goals and filling her bucket with what lights her up actually makes her a better mom and better person. So that medal that she's like got her, her the chip on her shoulder about and that she's just like chomping at the bit for, it's not just for vanity. It's really a representation of that resilience and inspiration too. Without the purity of that goal, I don't know if she or anyone else in this situation could have persevered to get to this point, right? It's like you have to be in it for the right reasons. Like when those priorities are securely in place and you relentlessly respect them and enforce them. Now that means sacrificing, saying no, not being able to do everything that maybe you want to do. It gives you the freedom to relentlessly pursue your goals and rise above challenges. I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive to say that, hey, sacrifice and priorities give you freedom, but it does. That's how so many softball leaders have embraced resiliency over the years, and that's what will keep our community going. So that's it. Be resilient through relentless prioritization. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, wherever else you listen, including Believe.com. And you can watch the videos on YouTube as well. Subscribe to the show, rate it, write a review for it, share it with your friends. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Believe in Softball. Again, B-L-E-A-V. You can always reach out to me on Twitter at JennaBacera01 and Instagram at JennaBacera as well. Thank you for tuning in and catch us soon.